Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, a clinical lab's response to a pandemic. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin Inc. and Diasorin Molecular. To learn more, visit molecular.diasorin.com backslash US backslash COVID-19 backslash. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Omax Garner, an Associate Clinical Professor, Section Chief, in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UCLA Health System. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Garner, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to thank LabRoots and Diasorin for putting together this talk on this very timely and important topic. So as mentioned, I am the section chief of clinical microbiology at the UCLA Health System. And today we're really going to dive in and discuss testing strategies to help manage the COVID-19 pandemic. So for my disclosures, I get research funding and honorarium from Diasorin Molecular. So our overall objective. So after today's talk, my hope is that you will be able to identify current COVID-19 testing status and what might be next for laboratories in the U.S., be able to define and fine-tune COVID-19 diagnostic algorithms for both a serological and molecular approach, and we hope to touch on both today, and then discuss current testing recommendations and their implementation by one clinical laboratory, by my clinical laboratory. I don't mean to say in this talk that my approach is the only approach. You know, I think with something as challenging as COVID-19, all of our laboratories have had to do everything that we can to be able to meet the need. I just want to present the UCLA approach as a potential model for how we're looking at combating this disease. But I want to start with some background. You know, I really think the story of coronavirus and the story of COVID-19 is a good place to begin. So, you know, as we know as laboratory professionals and medical professionals on this call, uh, pneumonia can be caused by many different types of pathogens, right? There are the classic bacterial pneumonia pathogens. There are the fungal pneumonia pathogens that affect the immune compromised patient. And, you know, I think that we classically think about a few pneumonia pathogens that are viruses. So if you say, name me a virus that causes pneumonia, I think everyone's going to say influenza A and B. And then I think there's another group that are going to definitely say respiratory syncytial virus. And I think in the immune competent patient, this really makes up the majority of viruses that we know to cause viral pneumonia. But actually the list of viruses that can cause viral pneumonia, especially in the immune compromised patient, is pretty long. And so you can see here, it includes rhinovirus, human metanumovirus, the four parainfluenza viruses, Boca virus, and then a long list. But of course, we're gonna focus today and the story today is around coronaviruses. And there are human coronaviruses that can cause viral pneumonia. So looking at coronaviruses as a group, coronaviruses are enveloped, non-segmented, single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses that are named after their corona or crown-like projections that you can see on these EM pictures. And they correspond to the large surface spike proteins that are found on these viruses. Now, coronaviruses were first recognized as an animal pathogen in the 30s, and human coronaviruses, or HCOVs, were first identified in the mid-1960s. So looking at the animal literature, these viruses infect respiratory and GI systems or gastrointestinal systems, 
as well as occasionally affecting the liver and neurological systems. Human coronaviruses as a group are mainly known to infect the upper respiratory and GI tract. So this is a really nice table of the known human coronaviruses. So there is uh, OC43, 229E, NL63, and HKU1. And if you look overall, sort of the third col fourth column in at the cell types that are infected, these viruses mainly affect ciliated airway epithelial cells. So really it's an infection of the upper airway or upper respiratory tract. So not surprisingly, if you look in the last column, the diseases that they cause are mainly upper respiratory. Some of them can definitely cause lower respiratory tract infection. And just like the known animal coronaviruses, some of them can even cause GI disease. Now, this leads us, I think, to this concept that we're going to talk about a lot today, which is spillover. Spillover is when a pathogen moves from one species into another species, and that's commonly described as a zoonotic infection. All of the coronaviruses have this particular pathway, and I want to give a shout out to one of my favorite books by David Quammen. It's called Spillover, and it really highlights in a... Um, very entertaining and scientific way, the way that these viruses and pathogens, including Hendra virus, malaria, SARS, which we'll talk about today, and others have spilled over from an animal population into a human population. Uh, on, the, on the right side with the pictorial that's there, I really want to outline this for coronaviruses. You know, the purpose of doing this is really kind of to demystify COVID-19. I feel like, you know, a lot of us were potentially caught by surprise that a coronavirus was able to spill over into the human population and then transmit around the world. So actually, this is a common mode of infection for coronaviruses. So if we look on the right side here, the natural host for NL63, which is the human coronavirus that's seen now circulating, is the bats. And the intermediate host is typically an organism that will become infected from the natural host and lead to an expansion of this virus before it spills over into human beings and then potentially transmits around the world. So it's unknown what the intermediate host is for NL63, but if we look at, let's say, OC43, this is another one of our human coronaviruses. It didn't start out as a human virus. It started out as a virus in rats. This spilled over into domestic cattle. From domestic cattle, it moved into a human population and then spread around the globe. As you can see that that is the common story for COVID-19 as well. So it's not that all coronaviruses do this, but I think that we need to look at COVID-19 in the context of other coronaviruses, human coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, to really understand that this is a common pathway for these particular viruses. So, you know, I think it brings us this really important point. How does a spillover which is a relatively common event. Anytime animals interact with human beings, you can have pathogens that move from one to another become a global pandemic, which we know is a relatively uncommon event. I think this pictorial really does a good job of describing this. So you have a set of viruses there, human coronavirus is one of them, and these viruses have a high host plasticity. What that means is they can infect a large number of species of animals. So you can see all these animals here potentially can harbor this virus. And then at that time, humans come into contact with these animals and then there's spillover. So a human being becomes infected. Now that does not mean at that point that that virus can infect other human beings. So it doesn't mean there will be human to human transmission. But if there is human to human transmission, there can be an amplification of that particular virus. And as we all know, we are a global community. I can get on a plane in Los Angeles and less than a day later, I can be almost anywhere in the world. That global spread of human beings amplifies human to human transmission, allowing viruses that are able to follow this pathway actually become global in their spread. This is exactly what we saw for COVID-19. This is partially what we saw for SARS. And this is actually what we originally saw for our circulating human coronaviruses as well. So what are some of the clinical manifestations of the circulating human coronaviruses? These cause the common cold. They're seasonal. The common cold is an upper respiratory tract infection characterized by rhinorrhea or runny nose, nasal congestion, sore throat, sneezing, something we've all had. Symptoms are self-limiting and typically peak on day three to four of illness. 
and less frequently, as we discussed before, these human coronaviruses can cause lower respiratory tract disease. This includes bronchiolitis, croup, and pneumonia, but these are primarily in infants and immune-compromised children. And if you look in laboratory medicine, so in my own lab, we use a respiratory pathogen panel that's actually able to diagnose this because in our transplant population, it's critically important to diagnose patients with this disease. If you look at the overall epidemiology, human coronaviruses are found worldwide. So even though the initial spread was a spillover from an animal to a human population, they quickly spread around the globe and they cause most disease in the winter and spring months. Uh, exposure is common in early childhood, and if you look at seropositivity for human coronaviruses, approximately 90% of adults will be seropositive. Uh, droplet and direct contact spread are the most likely common modes of transmission, although there is some evidence of indirect contact spread and aerosol spread, similar to how we look at COVID-19. And the incubation period for human coronaviruses is estimated to be about two to five days. Again, as we're discussing these other coronaviruses, I want you to think about how it relates or is potentially different to what we know, what we know about COVID-19. Now I wanna talk about some of the recent animal spillovers for diseases that were coronaviruses that had a higher mortality and morbidity rate than our human coronaviruses. So I'll start with SARS. So SARS-CoV in 2002 was first recognized in China and it caused a worldwide outbreak. Uh, the overall case number was relatively low, so 8,000 probable cases, but the mortality rate was actually very high. So 774 deaths were associated with disease. It leads to about a 10% mortality rate, but since 2004, there have not been any known cases of SARS-CoV infection reported anywhere in the world. Uh, the transmission, similar to other coronaviruses, you started with an animal reservoir that was found in bats. It appeared that the masked palm civet was the intermediate animal reservoir that caused transmission to human beings, and then we had human-to-human -human spread. Looking at clinical manifestations of SARS-CoV, or what is known now as classic SARS, because COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2, Adults and adolescents experience fever, myalgia, headache, malaise, and chills, followed by a non-productive cough and dyspnea, generally five to seven days later. Approximately 25% of infected adults developed watery diarrhea. Now, this is something that it appears is distinctly different from COVID-19, right? As we talked about those early animal coronaviruses, they could have GI syndrome. And with SARS-CoV, you saw more of that than what you see with COVID-19. GI syndrome with COVID-19 is actually much more rare. Interestingly, with SARS-CoV, and this is why the mortal mortality was so high, 20% of patients developed worsening respiratory distress requiring intubation and ventilation. We know with COVID-19, 20% of patients potentially get severe disease and require hospitalization, but not this many actually require intubation. The overall associated mortality was approximately 10%. And the case fatality rate in older people, so people older than 60 years, approached 50%. This is also true of COVID-19, is that it appears to cause more severe disease in people of advanced age and people that have comorbidities. In children with SARS, the disease was less severe. So no infants or children died from SARS-CoV infection in the 2002 and 2003 outbreak. And infants and children younger than 12 years of age who developed SARS typically presented with only fever, cough, and rhinorrhea. This is a similarity to COVID-19. We find less serious infection in children. So again, part of this sort of demystification process of COVID-19 is that a lot of clues on the behavior of COVID-19 we can find from SARS and we can find from human coronaviruses. Now, of course, this talk is geared towards our group of laboratory medical professionals. So I think it's interesting to look at laboratory diagnosis for SARS-CoV as well, or classic SARS. So respiratory and stool specimens may not be positive until the second week of illness when symptoms and viral loads peak. That is very interesting, and that is a distinction from COVID-19, where we're finding out more and more that viral loads may peak in the pre-symptomatic window, two to three days before symptomatic infection, whereas for SARS-CoV, they definitely peaked much later on. This may be a clue as to why not so many people got SARS-CoV, and yet COVID-19 infection is spreading around the world.
Here in this table found from the CDC website, you can see for PCR detection, there can be detection in sputum, bronchoalveolar lavage or BAL, and P-swab, OP-swab. It was even found in serum and stool. So now we're going to transition away from SARS-CoV or classic SARS into MERS. MERS was the next sort of known high morbidity, high mortality animal spillover event that led to some human-human transition, transmission from a coronavirus. Uh, this was discovered in 2014, but MERS transmission occurs even today. Globally, the World Health Organization has been notified of 1,100 laboratory confirmed cases of infection, but including at least 422 related deaths. So the mortality is even higher than SARS. Only two patients in the United States have ever tested positive. Both were healthcare workers who lived and worked in Saudi Arabia, and both traveled to the U.S. Uh, from Saudi Arabia, where they believed to have been infected. Both were hospitalized, but later discharged after fully recovered. Recent travelers from the Arabian Peninsula who develop a fever and symptoms of respiratory illness, such as cough or shortness of breath, within 14 days after traveling from countries in or near the Arabian Peninsula, may be considered for MERS. But an important point for MERS is it appears that human-to-human -human transmission is actually difficult. And most cases involve exposure to the intermediate organism, which in this case is a camel. So the story is still the same. You have animal-animal transmission from bat to a camel, and then potential animal-human transmission, but very, very limited human-to-human -human transmission. In MERS, it's really only been seen in hospital settings. So there's a wide clinical spectrum associated with MERS infection, including asymptomatic infection all the way up to acute upper or lower respiratory tract illness, and then rapidly progressive septic, septic shock, multi-organ failure, and death. The prodromal or early phase disease is associated with fever, chills, rigors, headache, and a non-productive cough, similar to what we see with the other coronaviruses. Most MERS COVID cases have been reported in adults, although children and adults of all ages have been infected. And most hospitalized MERS cases have had chronic comorbidities. Again, an establishment that's similar to SARS, an establishment that's similar to COVID-19, are this idea that people with chronic comorbidities will have worse disease. And unfortunately, among confirmed MERS COVID cases to date, the case fatality proportion has been as high as 35%. Now, interestingly, I want to discuss quickly lab diagnosis. So lab diagnosis for MERS, lower respiratory tract specimens such as BAL, sputum, and tracheal aspirates contain the highest viral loads. Again, this is something we want to think about in relation to COVID-19. So for MERS, it's recommended that both upper and lower respiratory tract specimens collected whenever possible. We're going to discuss some UCLA data around COVID-19 for this recommendation later. The World Health Organization criteria for a laboratory confirmed case includes either a positive RT-PCR result for at least two different targets on the MERS genome, or one positive RT-PCR result for a specific target on the MERS genome and an additional different RT-PCR product sequence. This is interesting because it starts to open up the idea that if you're going to have a PCR that's specific for one of these coronaviruses, that PCR needs to be multiple targets. For all of us running COVID-19 tests within our laboratories, we know that almost all, very many of the COVID-19 tests are multiple target in order to appreciate specificity. Uh, for serum antibody testing for MERS, serum specimens should be collected during the acute stage of disease, preferably the first week, and again after convalescence three weeks later to be able to show production of IgG. So after a review of SARS and MERS, Let's get to COVID-19. Let's start to talk about SARS-CoV-2. So this is the website that I'm following on a regular basis to track this outbreak, and you can really see the global impact of this outbreak. So as of July 1st, there were 10,538,000 confirmed cases, and this is hitting everywhere across the globe. So you can see there really has been no country or no area that has been untouched by this particular disease sort of speaking to the contagious nature of this particular organism. And then if we focus in on the United States, you can see that infection is unfortunately rampant in all parts of the country. And so at that point, 215,000 confirmed infections in New York, 
103,000 confirmed infections where I live in Los Angeles, and you can see the entire spread across uh, our country. So again, you know, I think this leads us to this example. How did we get to this point? How did we get to this point, and how is lab diagnostics either affect our getting to this point or attempt to get us out of this? How does a spillover, an animal spillover, become a pandemic? So for the next few slides, I really want to kind of discuss the early story of COVID-19 and how it relates specifically to testing. So around the end of December, there were confirmed a cluster of pneumonia cases of an unknown cause. And I want to emphasize that from a diagnostic perspective, from a molecular diagnostics perspective especially, we're in a completely different time in 2019 than we were in 2002 when SARS hit. The capability of viral genome sequencing, of creating PCRs rapidly, is so much more advanced than it was now, which is why I think you saw this accelerated timeline in discovering what pathogen was the cause of this. So with the cluster of cases, it was realized by early January, there were 41 confirmed cases, seven severe, one death, and all of these cases were negative by the typical assays that are run in clinical microbiology laboratory, right? They were negative for flu, as we talked about. Viral flu is where you would want to start. They were negative for RSV. They were negative for these tests, these respiratory pathogen tests that cover a large range of cold viruses. They were even negative for SARS and MERS. So January 8th, the Chinese CDC identified a novel coronavirus in one of the patient samples. And literally two days later, which is amazingly fast from a molecular diagnostic perspective, the first genome was released, and it was understood that this was a novel coronavirus very closely related to SARS. So it was named Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS Coronavirus 2. Initial cases were thought to be linked to a single seafood market where there was potential animal spillover, but I think that it was very quickly realized that there was human-to-human -human transmission going on, and this was a much larger story than just an animal spillover event. So let's fast forward, and I want to take you through kind of how UCLA was looking at this. So by January 15th, our Emerging Infectious Disease Group, which involves epidemiologists, infectious disease clinicians, and then, of course, the microbiology laboratory, had started to get together to figure out a way to potentially screen patients for COVID-19. So this was this focus on PUIs, or persons under investigation. At this point, these were definitions as put out by the CDC. It included identification of people based on travel history to mainland China, and symptoms of cough, shortness of breath, and or fever. Some of the main symptoms that were associated with SARS. Uh, interestingly, we have one of the world's largest airports in Los Angeles with LAX, and we are at UCLA, one of the travel hospitals to serve LAX. So if someone's gonna be sick as a traveler, they can come into our hospital. So the idea is that people would be screened at LAX for these symptoms if the travel was correct and brought directly to UCLA. Now, the diagnosis for COVID-19 is not symptomatic, right? Upper or even lower respiratory tract infection, it's very difficult to say exactly what the offending pathogen is just based on symptoms. So this is where testing actually becomes critical in the importance of not only treating a patient, but determining what's going on with an outbreak. So at this time, uh, the only testing that was available in the United States was performed at the CDC. Uh, as everybody on this call is aware, Los Angeles is nowhere near Atlanta, Georgia. So we had a five to six day turnaround time with these particular patients to be able to rule out this particular disease. And as all of us on this call can imagine, and our CDC colleagues can imagine, the CDC quickly became overwhelmed with the volume of test requests. If you imagine the number of travelers that are coming into the United States from countries potentially that have disease, the testing wasn't able to keep up with that. So in February, the idea was to try and move the tests out of the CDC and into our state and county public health laboratories. So we have one of, you know, in my opinion, the premier public health laboratories across the country in LA County. And our LA County Public Health Laboratory was gonna bring on COVID-19 testing. This would be a huge advantage for Los Angeles because it would be able to reduce turnaround time. The CDC assay was distributed to state and county public health laboratories, but unfortunately, at that time, the assay failed validation. 
So there were three targets for that assay all around the nucleocapsid gene, target N1, N2, and N3. You'll remember before we talked about an expansion of targets with MERS in order to have appropriate specificity. All three needed to be positive for a positive PCR, but the N3 target failed QC testing. This unfortunately delayed the ability for public health laboratories to start testing. Eventually, the CDC dropped that particular target, the necessity for that target, and state and public health labs started testing. Our laboratory in LA County brought up testing and started providing testing for the community. Unfortunately, quickly they became overwhelmed by the volume of test requests. So again, testing is unfortunately falling behind the overall clinical need for the number of patients. I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Hemarajata, one of my former fellows at UCLA that now uh, is a assistant director in the public health laboratory at LA County and is helping to lead and perform testing there. Okay, so you know, I think the question that a lot of us had from the clinical laboratories as we were watching this happen is that when were we going to be allowed to be able to perform testing? So on February 29th, clinical laboratories were allowed to perform testing for COVID-19. So what did that mean specifically? I wanna piece this apart because even though it opened up, it actually didn't allow very many laboratories to do the testing. So labs could perform either the FDA emergency use authorization approved CDC test, which is the CDC COVID-19 PCR assay. The challenge with that specific test is it required specialized equipment that wasn't available in most clinical labs. Highly trained CLS with molecular microbiology experience, which is also very difficult to find. And so most clinical labs couldn't bring up that particular test. The other option presented by the FDA was to perform a laboratory developed test for COVID-19. The challenge of developing your own molecular test is that it requires specialized equipment not available in most clinical labs highly trained CLS, molecular microbiology experience, and most clinical labs don't have this either. So unfortunately, even though there was an allowance from a regulatory perspective to perform testing, the reality is that even by late February, most clinical laboratories could not perform COVID-19 PCR testing. Now, fortunately for us at UCLA, we had all of the component pieces necessary to perform the CDC test in-house, and so, by March 10th, we actually brought up the CDC COVID-19 RT-PCR test. Looking specifically at that test, it's now a two-target test, as we talked about, for the N1, N2 gene. Just some details from a lab medicine perspective, uh, the crossing threshold or CT value cutoff for the targets is 40. Uh, the result is an inconclusive if only one of two targets is positive, and I'm going to show you some data later as to whether we think early on those were false positives or weak positives. And of course, the assay is invalid if the internal control fails. And the throughput on this particular assay is not very high. So let's walk through that for because we all know that we're being asked to perform you know, up to thousands of tests a day. For this particular test, it required certain extraction equipment that got expanded over time, but of course there was reagent shortage. The extraction takes a couple hours. And then the PCR setup required three wells per patient, a well for each individual target. So if you're running a 96 well plate, you know, at max you could do 30 samples. But if you remember early on, the suggestion was to take a nasal pharyngeal separate from an oral pharyngeal. So now you have to use two, so that's six wells per patient. So now overall in a run that can take up to eight hours, you can do very, very few patients overall. And this was some of the very early constraints for us expanding testing to the population. So, you know, I think we were all sort of waiting as the FDA was giving EUA authorization for other tests so that more and more clinical labs could expand. So here you can see February 4th, the CDC test became EUA approved. Again, not approved for clinical labs to run, but approved early on. That wasn't until the 29th. Other laboratories submitted laboratory developed tests like Wadsworth, uh, LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics. And then what we started to see was tests come on the market being available for clinical laboratories. So by mid-March, you started to see companies like Thermo Fisher, companies like Abbott Molecular, companies like Diasorin, Genmark, Cepheid have products come on the market that could be then run in the clinical labs. The advantage of this, and again, the partnership between molecular diagnostic companies and clinical laboratories is essential 
for being able to bring up this type of testing is it allowed us to expand testing at UCLA. So we were able to bring on the DSORN molecular RT-PCR test. This is the Simplexa COVID-19 direct kit. Uh, the targets on the virus are a little bit different. So this looks at the S gene and the open reading frame one gene. Uh, the CT value cutoff is 40. Interestingly, with this assay, you only needed one target to be positive to call a sample positive. Now, I'll show you some data a little bit later on. Um, we feel that one target ends up being reasonably appropriate from a specificity perspective to call positive value. Um, for all of these tests, reagent allocation was, a, was an issue, right? I think that all of us in clinical labs, either doing testing or running labs, have seen that we can't necessarily get as much reagent as we could possibly run because of the overall need. It's difficult for companies to keep up. So we were on a 350 test a day reagent allocation, which I think put us in one of the more fortunate situations very early on. Acceptable specimens for this was nasal pharyngeal swabs and nasal swabs, and then this has grown now to include BALs. And it's really a medium throughput system. So depending on how many of these tests that you have that you can run continuously, the test is relatively fast. Runtime itself is only 90 minutes compared to some other system where you have to do extraction, off-put extraction, and run PCR. Now, again, my hospital system continued to ask us to meet the clinical need by running more and more testing. So we looked at a third system to bring in, and I think you've seen this across the board at a lot of clinical laboratories. We're all running multiple systems specifically to be able to run COVID-19 testing. So for the Thermo Fisher TAC path assay for COVID-19, which we also perform, we are running, it's an N-gene, S-gene, ORF1 targeted system. And the inconclusives in this setting is one out of three positive is inconclusive. If it's two out of the other three gene targets, then that's considered a positive. Our throughput in this particular assay is expanding up to about 1,000 tests per day. And the acceptable specimens on this is nasal pharyngeal swab and BAL. So this is really our high throughput system. We're running it on the Kingfisher for extraction. The PCR setup is multiplex, so you only need one well per patient. And then we're using the ABI 7500, very similar to the CDC assay, to perform testing. So, you know, I think a lot of us are in an unusual scenario, as discussed before, where we have a lot of different tests for these same specific analytes, right? If you look across the board at most clin micro labs, you aren't running, let's say, three different tests for HIV viral load. The reason you don't do that is tests have different sensitivities and specificities, and you don't want to end up having kind of a good test versus a not so good test and triaging patients. So an important analysis for us in thinking about testing for COVID-19 PCR is how are our tests performing overall? And so this really is an analysis of about 10,000 test results that we did a few months ago comparing three of our assays. Comparing the CDC RT-PCR assay on the left, the DSOR and Simplexa direct assay in the middle, and the TAC path or Thermo Fisher assay on the right. You can see in the graph, we divided them up by number of specimens and then really started to look at overall CT values for our patients. Are we seeing CT values skew depending on the gene targets, right? This is really important because if one assay looks at the S gene and one assay looks at the N gene, potentially they don't have the same level of sensitivity for figuring out whether the virus is there. So one good thing that came from our analysis is we learned overall, it looks like sort of the spread of patients that have been tested, there's an equivalent spread of strong positive, medium positive, and weak positive samples as assessed by CT value. In addition, if you look at our positivity rates overall, we have about a 7% positivity rate on the CDC test, 6% on the Diasorin test, Simplexa, and about 4% on our Thermo Fisher. This made sense to us that even though they weren't the same, our Thermo Fisher test is mainly an outpatient test, whereas our inpatient really drives towards the Diasorin test, so we see a little bit higher uh, positivity rate. And then if we look overall at either inconclusive or invalid, the numbers end up being uh, low. So that's good, meaning we're not having to repeat testing very much. So, you know, I think 
around PCR tests, one of the more common questions that I receive as a clinical lab director is, is this test sensitive, right? My physicians call, lots of group call, and they want to know. And one of the reasons is because there were some early publications that came out, I focus on this one in JAMA, that suggested that nasal swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs, actually had a very low percent positivity or sensitivity versus something like a lower respiratory tract specimen like a BAL. So how do we answer this, or how do we even analyze this in the laboratory? You know, I think that one way of looking at sensitivity is analytical sensitivity. Analytical sensitivity is really this measure of how good is your PCR assay? How few viral copies can you recognize? And when we do some analytical sensitivity measurements on some of our assays, we find our assays are, I would call them exquisitely sensitive. They can be sensitive all the way down to 100 copies of virus per mil. The way that I talk to my physicians about this is, if there is virus in the sample, our assay is going to find it. But the real question, and this is a question of clinical sensitivity is, is there any virus in the sample? Or how likely is a negative to be a false negative? And for clinical sensitivity, there's a whole lot more parameters that go into understanding that. This includes specimen type. Is it a nasopharyngeal swab? Is it an oral pharyngeal swab? Is it saliva? Is it mid-terminate or anterior nares? All of those things depend on how much virus can be collected. In addition, is it a good nasopharyngeal swab, right? It was a called nasopharyngeal, but the collector didn't go in as far as they could have. And then additionally, stage of illness ends up being critically important. I think we're still learning this from this disease. Where is the virus at what time? So if someone's within the first two to three days of symptoms, what's the best specimen to collect? Let's say someone's having severe disease, what's the best specimen to collect? So in that sort of thing, we all want to be able to understand overall these comments that say, I heard your PCR test only has a 63% sensitivity. So what we really wanted to determine at UCLA is how do we actually estimate clinical sensitivity? How do we take the results that we have to answer this question about all of the variabilities that can come in and figure out, do we have a test that's really only 60% sensitive when we're doing nasopharyngeal swabs? So in that setting, we took this idea that a false negative patient is a patient with an initial negative PCR test that has subsequent testing at any time and it's positive. And again, this is a symptomatic analysis. Where a true negative patient would be a patient with an initial negative PCR test, but the results remain negative for all subsequent testing. So dividing up, we actually have a substantial amount of repeat testing that goes on at UCLA for nasal pharyngeal swabs. This is to our advantage in being able to understand clinical sensitivity. So if you look at the first table below, 811 patients ended up having an initial negative result and had repeat tests on that negative, and of those 811, 795 were true negatives, meaning the second test ended up being negative as well, where only 16 ended up having a positive test after that. This is important because it really gives an understanding of clinical sensitivity around 98% for a first time nasal pharyngeal swab that's a negative in a symptomatic patient. So this really helped to sort of allay some of the fears around clinical sensitivity in our system. Interestingly, we also wanted to do this analysis to see there is, if there was variability amongst the three PCR assays. And as you can see on the table below, if you break up the initial negative and then subsequent testing, you see that they all end up having a sensitivity that is around 98%. So, you know, this equates to the sensitivity that we see for a lot of our assays and really sort of, I think, helps with an understanding or at least an argument against when people push and say, oh, the nasal pharyngeal test does not have good sensitivity. Now, we don't know in an asymptomatic population. I have to emphasize that this is symptomatic data to be able to say that about a first-time negative nasal pharyngeal swab. The same study would need to be repeated in the asymptomatic population, but this would be challenging because the positivity rates in those populations are very low. So the next question that came up, you know, and I think we addressed this a little bit earlier, is which specimen type is most sensitive? That early JAMA paper suggested that lower respiratory tract testing may be most important. And you know, this is what we saw with SARS. If you remember back to the lab diagnostics for SARS, it was really lower respiratory tract testing that had the highest yield. 
So what do we see for COVID-19? So we picked apart our specimens coming in. Of course, we're doing lower respiratory versus upper respiratory. And I want to point out a few things. So first, if you look at BAL, 20 positive out of 284 collected, that's a 7% positivity rate. Versus our nasal pharyngeal, we're only at a 3.2% positivity rate. You know, I think on first glance, that may imply that BAL is, in fact, a more sensitive specimen source for severely treated patients. But when we pick these data apart, what we find is that all lower respiratory tract positive patients at UCLA have also had a preceding positive upper respiratory tract sample. So in that setting, our data, we're not finding patients who are upper respiratory tract negative or NP swab negative, but lower respiratory tract positive. When we find it in the lower, we also find it in the upper. But we know this is not the experience at all centers. So what we tell our clinicians, especially in the severe side, is we endorse sending us both. Send us an upper respiratory, send us a lower respiratory. We do feel that the nasopharyngeal is the best collection, but there is some solid data out there to suggest in the symptomatic patient, and again, I have to emphasize here, I'm only talking about the symptomatic patient. In the symptomatic patient, other sources may also be appropriate, mid-terminate, oral pharyngeal potentially, saliva. I don't think we know anything in the asymptomatic, but in the symptomatic, you know, I think these patients have a very, they have a high amount of virus. You know, we can sort of see this from the CT values, not a direct comparison like viral load, but we see an increase, decreased CT values, which means increased amount of virus in patients who are symptomatic. So the next question I really want to address is the inconclusive results. You know, I think we started this out by saying multi-target may be necessary for specificity, but what does it mean if only one target is positive on these tests where if one target is positive, it's an inconclusive. So this is an analysis of symptomatic patients run on the CDC test early on in disease. So this was in March for us. So we had six patients that had inconclusive results, and we wanted to do a deep dive on the likelihood of those patients either being true positive or false positive. And so what we found across the board, and you can see the data here, the specimen date, the specimen type, whether there was a first test or a repeat test, and which target was positive, N1 or N2. As we did an analysis that included exposure, repeat testing, what we found is that, in our opinion, five out of these six were most likely positives, true positives, and the inconclusive represented a weak positive result whereas one out of the six really looked more like a false positive. There wasn't any other data to suggest, and on follow-up testing, they were always negative. So what does this overall mean? You know, I, I'm not quite sure what this overall means. I think that it means that there are certain settings that inconclusive is going to be a weak positive. And because these were symptomatic patients, you know, I think a lot of this is about your pretest probability. I think in a very symptomatic patient, the pretest probability is high for COVID, an inconclusive result could definitely be a weak positive. Whereas now when there's more asymptomatic testing going on, we need to do a reanalysis of our inconclusives because potentially we would see the opposite of this. And maybe they're more likely false positives when you're testing people who really are asymptomatic and do not have a high likelihood of COVID. So again, we haven't made any broad sweeping statements, but I do think it's interesting to analyze inconclusive results overall. Now, I want to share some of our total data from UCLA. So um, if you look overall from our inpatient perspective, we've had a, about a 1.4% positivity rate, outpatient 2.4%, ED 4.2%, uh, and total we've come up with about a 2.6%. The challenge of looking overall at positivity, though, is it really is about who you're testing. So at UCLA, we're fortunate enough to have enough testing capability in my laboratory to not only perform symptomatic testing, but to perform asymptomatic screening on patients that are coming in for procedures that could be at high risk if they ended up having the infection to the people performing those procedures, to our physicians, to our techs, to anyone involved in a patient care setting. When you start to screen a large amount of asymptomatic patients, by definition, it's going to bring down your overall percent positivity. So maybe that's not the best marker of what's going on with symptomatic disease. If you can see over time, though, early on in March, 
In early March, we peaked at a percent positivity of 16%, low volume being tested, but all of them being potentially symptomatic, and has gone down over time. But what you can see is in late June and early July, as sort of you're seeing with the rest of the country, we are starting to bump back up in positivity rate. Also, our overall number of positives are coming up as well. Looking at testing volumes, this has been one of the sort of extreme changes seen in a microbiology laboratory, and I really want to thank all of the laboratory professionals that are on this call for all of the work that we're doing to fight COVID-19. This is the representation at UCLA. You can see on March 9th, we started doing zero cases. And per day and following the blue line, we've peaked now. So this is, goes out to 629. We had a day last week where we did 1,200 in a day, 1,200 PCR tests in a single day. And so really, it takes a heroic effort across the country by our laboratory testing professionals to be able to pull this off in support of fighting this pandemic. So this is our example at UCLA. And I know all labs have been pushing to be able to meet their need. So overall, just to show what's going on at UCLA specifically, we've tested at that point 38,000 patients. Now we're up above 42,000 and our number of positive patients that are there. So I want to leave PCR now and spend a few slides talking about serology before we end. So the clinical use of COVID-19 serology is, is interesting. You know, I think it's a test where we have a result that we don't exactly know what to do with at this point. So it's unclear if antibodies are protective or neutralizing. And a lot of the tests have different antigen targets for antibodies. And so it's hard to know exactly what is being measured. But we do know that antibody serology plus aggressive PCR are probably our best strategies for continued to fighting this particular infection. And there's some data to suggest that the median time to seroconversion maybe around 14 days is probably later, probably 21 to 28 days as a median. But we also know overall that um, every single individual antibody test doesn't behave the same. So originally there were a lot of non-FDA reviewed tests. There are point of care tests, target choice, ends up being very important, and target choice is going to vary amongst the tests. So the landscape is very dynamic from a serology perspective. I would say the landscape is also very dynamic from a PCR perspective, but overall, almost all of the RT-PCR assays, no matter what their targets were, have behaved very similarly. This sort of analysis is not fully done from a serology perspective. So I want to present to you what we're doing at UCLA. We use the in-house we, in house, we use the Diasorin COVID 19 IgG chemiluminescent immunoassay. The antibody target is the spike protein, and data from the package insert shows a 97.6% sensitive, sensitivity in patients that are six days past PCR positivity. Again, you may not be PCR tested right away, so you're estimating this is reaching that 21 to 28 day window post infection. And it's up to 99% sensitive. 14 days past PCR positivity, and importantly has a 99.3% specificity. Specificity is going to be critically important because false positives on the serology test may give people a sense of protection if antibodies mean you're immune, and we still don't know that yet, but if they do in the case of a positive test result. Uh, you know, we can have with the instruments that we have, if the reagent allocation and, and the need was there, a potential 3,000 tests per day capacity. And this is a similar platform we run other serology tests on. So we're averaging about 200 tests a day on the weekdays, and we are running about a 6% overall rate. So, so what does that mean? So I think it's important as we close out here to do a little bit of lab medicine general analysis and an understanding of positive predictive value and sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity and specificity is really the chance of your test giving a false negative and false positive outside of the context of prevalence of disease. But in really to understand positive predictive value or negative predictive value, meaning the likelihood of a true positive versus a false positive, that's positive predictive value, or likelihood of a true negative versus false negative, you have to include the prevalence of disease in a society. So this is a table that represents some of the uh, prevalence tables that would be associated with a test 
with a 97% sensitivity and 99.3% specificity. So let's go to the areas where let's say prevalence is 20%. If prevalence of a disease is 20%, meaning out of the people that you're testing, 20% of them are potentially positive. The positive predictive value is high, meaning that if you get a positive, you have a 96% chance that that positive is a true positive. But if you go to the other extreme end and the prevalence is only 1%, and again, the specificity of this test is very high, it's 99.3%. The prevalence or amount of disease drives down the positive predictive value. So ultimately, you only have a 50% positive predictive value if you get a positive. So if the prevalence of disease is low in society and somebody gets a serology test that's positive, there's only a 50-50 shot that that's a true positive versus a false positive. This is why it's very difficult right now to suggest that anybody get a serology test if they fit in this 1% prevalence category. We really should be using our serology tests for places that have a higher prevalence. So the question is then, who has a higher prevalence and who should be tested? So this is really our decision at UCLA. I think other places have come to other decisions. But again, this is what we're suggesting. In order to increase the prevalence or likelihood that someone has had COVID-19, we believe serology testing could be used in the setting of suspected prior infection that was not tested by PCR. As we covered on this, a lot of people potentially had disease and there wasn't PCR testing available. Close contacts of high-risk patients who may have been exposed to the virus healthcare workers and first responders. This represents a group that has a potential much higher prevalence than the community at large. Patients residing in congregate settings that may have been exposed to or infected with the virus in the past, but who are not actively infected with the virus. These are settings where you're seeing outbreaks like nursing home facilities, like jails, where there's potentially a high concentration of infected individuals. Potentially patients who are scheduled for a procedure or surgery, you may be able to use serology to avoid repeat PCR testing, and then if immunity is something that's correlated with antibody testing. And then in the setting of potential plasma donation uh, for convalescent therapy, I think that this ends up being one of the most straightforward uses of the serology test. Where should it not be used? And I think this is critically important. P serology testing for IgG, which are the approved serology tests, should not be used to diagnose acute COVID-19. And then generally, because IgG doesn't come up that early, and then generally it should not be used for testing low-risk community patients with no suspicion of recent infection who may simply be curious or want to know if they were infected. Because again, we fall into the prevalence of having a poor predictive value, even if you have a very good test. So I hope uh, over the course of this lecture, you were able to get an idea on how PCR and serology testing is being used at UCLA. You know, I think it's an ever-changing environment as we learn more and more about immunity. We may learn better on how to use our serology tests as we learn more and more about sort of the earlier phases of disease and asymptomatic carriers, we can better use our PCR tests. But I will say that as lab medicine professionals, we have never been more in the forefront. So LA Times has featured our laboratory at UCLA. Here, our senior specialist, Brian Boland, was featured uh, in an article, UC has a solution to the national shortage of coronavirus testing. Do it in-house. In addition, other members of my laboratory were highlighted. And so, you know, I think that again, as laboratory medical professionals, we've always known that our work is critical to patient care. But now I think it's being seen across the country how critical it is. And I want to thank everybody working in a laboratory setting, helping to fight COVID-19 or perform any level of laboratory testing. I want to finish with my acknowledgement slide. This is part of my virology group. This group of techs and staff has been working overtime, volunteering on the weekends to provide COVID-19 testing for our patients and our hospital system. I want to thank all of them. I want to thank Dr. Sean Yang, uh, our associate director, and Dr. Sarah Dry, uh, my department chair, for some of the slides that I used, and then Allison Nomura for providing a lot of the data analysis for this particular talk. I want to thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you, Dr. Garner, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, 
please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. We have quite a few questions that have already come in from our live audience. Dr. Garner, can you provide your thoughts on the CDC recommendation for the differential diagnosis of flu and COVID-19 in the upcoming flu season? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a great question. I think diagnostics are going to play a very important role for the upcoming flu season. So, you know, I think that it's important to recognize that while there may be small differences between COVID-19 infection and flu infection from a symptom perspective, many of the symptoms are shared. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult for our physician colleagues, our healthcare practitioner colleagues to be able to differentiate a flu case from a COVID-19 case. And so while there's gonna be the expectation we should have a lot of those, you know, it's really gonna be on diagnostic manufacturers and then clinical laboratories to bring in testing algorithms to differentiate these two as quickly as possible because we definitely expect, whether it's you're gonna describe it as a second wave or a third wave, we definitely expect a large number of COVID-19 cases coupled with a large number of influenza cases, and they're gonna be very difficult to differentiate from a symptoms perspective. Thank you for that. And do you envision in the future the need to have assays with indications for screening of all individuals, not just the suspected, suspected um, so that we can have an accurate infection control? Yeah, that is also sort of the question of the hour, right? I think that as a country, we're getting a better hold of doing symptomatic and suspected testing. We're not where we need to be. And I've definitely been in conversation with areas of the country where there is still not nearly enough testing for symptomatic and suspected patients. But having sort of trying to approach that threshold, I think we will continue to make progress. But it really doesn't tell us about asymptomatic transmission of this particular disease, which we know is very important. So some level of large-scale asymptomatic surveillance screening is going to occur, but it, it needs to occur, but it needs to occur sort of outside of the limited reagent and people constraints of our clinical laboratories, right? Because whatever test it's going to be that's going to, let's say, survey 10,000 people on a weekly basis, that's going to be part of how we get back to work, you know, we're going to have to come up with and assist with very new diagnostics and new ways of thinking about diagnostics. So, for example, potentially with some of these easier collection sources, like that's where saliva can fit in. That may be where sort of large-scale sequencing assays can fit in to be able to supplement our testing of suspected and um, symptomatic patients. Thank you, Dr. Garner, and I want to thank our audience for these very thought-provoking questions. Dr. Garner, what are your thoughts on when the infection rate may come down in the U.S., or will we have to live with COVID-19 in the foreseeable future? Well, you know, I think we've learned a lot over this past sort of few weeks in July that any sort of expectation that we're going to see infection rates go down, we are a long way away from. And there are hot spots jumping up all over the country. And, you know, I think that it's, it's very, very difficult to control this particular infection. And, you know, I think widespread use of some of the policies that we know work, like masking, like paying attention to social distancing, you know, these are just things that we've had trouble adopting as a nation and taking on to be able to protect each other. So, you know, as long as we're not able to sort of make headway that way, I think we can continue to expect what's going on and we can continue to expect this level of infection until we have a vaccine. You know, I wish I could be more optimistic about that, but that just doesn't appear to be where we are right now as a country, but I'm hopeful. While not optimistic, I'm definitely hopeful that we can bring down the overall infection rate, but it is going to take people, you know, their own individual behaviors is what is how we fight this. Absolutely. And when is a lower respiratory sample essential for COVID-19 testing? For example, BAL and Sputin. Yeah, you know, I think that whether it's going to be BAL or tracheal aspirates or sputum or any of these things, it's really about severe disease in the hospital. You know, I think our experience at 
UCLA is that we do feel a nasopharyngeal may be appropriate in all stages of disease, but you could, I've seen scenarios, I've read case studies where upper respiratory tract infection was negative, yet lower respiratory, there was virus there for diagnosis. So in that setting, I do think that for the hospitalized patient, it is appropriate to either order both, an upper and a lower, or if the upper is negative, and you know the clinician really feels that COVID-19 is high on the differential, by all means, sort of collect a lower respiratory specimen and send it to the laboratory. Thank you, Dr. Garner. We have time for a few more questions. And I just wanna remind our audience that any question is not answered um, right now will be answered via email. Dr. Gardner, can you provide your thoughts on the CDC recommendation for orthogonal testing in serology? Yeah, you know, I think this is a very interesting recommendation by the CDC and may end up being very important. So the concept of orthogonal testing is really testing by one antibody test that has one target and then testing by a different antibody test that has a separate target. And this really gets at specificity. So if you have a test that has a spike protein target, you recognize that antibody, and you have a test that has a nucleocapsid protein target, if you run both and they're both positive, the likelihood of that being a true positive becomes higher. So, right, we talked about prevalence and false positivity and positive predictive value. So I believe that's what's being thought of there. You know, I think that until we sort of know whether or not antibody and antibody testing positivity is related to immunity, we'll get closer to that level of recommendation, but I do think it's interesting to take a two-target approach to increase the positive predictive value. And do you see value in identifying or measuring IgM response and IgG response with serology testing as opposed to just the total measurement value? Yeah, that is also a question that I don't think we have enough data on. So most of the tests that are available now are either total or IgG, total meaning any antibody that's there, mostly IgG and IgM, and just IgG. I think the challenge of IgM itself is that, you know, I think we know in lab medicine, IgM tends to be a little bit more cross-reactive than IgG, you know, and we're already sort of battling this challenge of positive predictive value. And so if you bring on an antibody test that may even be a little bit more cross-reactive, are we diagnosing disease? And then really this concept of can IgM be used to diagnose acute disease? Well, you know, I think that PCR does a good job of diagnosing acute disease. You could imagine a scenario where IgM may be able to supplement that, but I think the challenge is if there's an IgM test that is presented as an acute disease test, it'll attempt to replace PCR, not supplement PCR, and I think that that's dangerous because IgM will come up later than PCR positivity. Thank you for that. And we have time for one more question. This one's about the FDA. Europe now has serology tests that quantify neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Should FDA consider making these available in the U.S. and why? Um, so my answer to that is yes. I do think that if we have a neutralizing antibody test that's easy to perform, so not a plaque reduction neutralization assay itself, but a neutralizing antibody claim on some of our antibody tests, it may do better at predicting immunity if neutralizing antibody is what's conveying immunity. Now, that may be an oversimplification of the immune system, right? Potentially, T-cell-driven immunity may be what's important for this particular disease. So the correlation of neutralizing antibody with immunity may not be there, but to me, the more sort of validated tests that we have available in our repertoire to use against this disease, the better we'll be able to understand that. So, you know, widespread availability of a neutralizing antibody test allows us to run clinical studies, allows us to better analyze whether immunity is held there and what that means for a person who's serologically positive. So I'm a fan, you know, I hope the FDA takes a serious look at those assays and if they are, high enough quality for patient testing in the United States, I would hope that they would move quickly to be able to approve that. Dr. Garner, thank you for your presentation. Would you like to provide any final comments for our audience before we finish today? Uh, I would just like to, of course, thank LabRoots and Diasorin for putting this on, but mostly I wanna thank every single 
laboratory professional that is listening to this particular talk. Your work has been essential in our fight against this particular disease. And, you know, I think you can see, I mean, honestly, we get calls all the time from our nurses, from our physicians, just thanking our laboratory for making testing available for this. So all the work that you're doing, you know, you really, it is well appreciated to fight this pandemic. So I want to thank you all. And then I also want to emphasize, you know, please, please, please wear your masks. Wear your masks when you're at work. Wear your masks when you're outside of work. Let's do everything that we can to be able to fight this particular disease. Thank you again, Dr. Garner, for your time today, for your important research. I'd also like to thank Labroot and our sponsor, Dia Soren, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And LabRoots will alert you via email when this webinar is available for replay. So we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, be safe, take care, bye-bye.